But you know that feeling when you've got something to do that you dread, an awkward conversation, a tricky relationship, a piece of work that seems too complex to even begin. Or share a thought for Isaiah. If you were here last week, you'll have seen the sorry state of affairs in Jerusalem. On the surface, they were prosperous and peaceful. Yet then came Isaiah with the task of pulling back the fancy wallpaper and revealing the cracks and damp beneath. For as we saw last week, the people had rebelled against God. They'd forgotten their father and turned away from him. Not an easy job for Isaiah, but perhaps if the people were going to respond with positive, positively turning back to God, then well, that would be a motivation, wouldn't it, for him to go? But then chapter 6 and his commission from verse 9. If you've got your Bibles, do keep them open. Page 690, I'm going to read from verse 9, his commission. And these words are actually quoted in all four Gospels and Acts. So they're pretty important. He, the Lord God, said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, Make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise they may see with their eyes, Hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, And turn and be healed. It's not that the door to salvation is closed, but Isaiah sent with a message that's going to block their ears and dull their eyes so that they can't see it, that they just walk on by, unaware. It's a message of judgment. It's like God is saying, you want to turn away and ignore me? Fine. I'll make it permanent. It's pretty hopeless, isn't it? Half a century, Isaiah was to preach a message that he knew was going to be rejected. Is there any hope? Well, yes, there is actually quite a lot of hope in Isaiah. Chapters 1 to 5, as we saw last week, they majored on judgment. But then, chapters 7 to 12, those motifs that we've seen a little of, of hope, they're going to become dominant, they're going to shine through. And we'll be seeing one of them, God willing, next week. And the question that we're faced with as we read through these opening chapters is this. How can such a stubbornly rebellious people ever be changed? How can they go from the the sin and just judgment of chapters 1 to 5 to the glorious hope of chapters 7 to 12? Well, perhaps you've guessed it. The answer, of course, is chapter 6. It's a chapter that you'd expect to be. Uh, Chapter 1, his commissioning, his call to the work. But he's delayed it to chapter 6. Because here he's like a bridge, like a transition. He's like the prototype of the people of God. And in his experience, we see how you can transition from an unwilling sinner to ready and saved to be a witness for God. The answer is a little bit like a domino run, not the pizza chain, but like those huge videos you get on YouTube, you know, where you tap the first domino and it goes down the whole house. But this run only has four stages, though pretty big stages, stages that transform Isaiah's life. So let's look at those four stages. And stage one, he sees the Lord's holiness. Well, back to chapter six, verse one. It's the year that King Uzziah died, a defining moment. What would the new king be like? But amongst the uncertainty, Isaiah is given a vision of another king. It seems that he was in the temple, perhaps he was worshipping, when heaven and earth merged. As he looked, he saw the heavenly throne room and the Lord, that is God, sitting on his throne. It's not just any throne. See verse 1. It's high and exalted, higher than any earthly throne, exalted above any human ruler. Imagine it. 
But then you can't quite, because we're not actually told what God looks like. Did you see that? We're just given one small detail in verse 1. The train of his robe filled the temple. It's quite a hard picture for us today, I think. But we have weddings, don't we? I remember watching the wedding of Prince William and Kate. Kate there, I thought, had a pretty long train. But then someone told me about Princess Diana's wedding. I wonder if you remember that. And her train, eight meters flowing behind her. Glorious. Now maybe you think that's over the top. Certainly in our church it'd be over the top. But in a grand cathedral, it works. It reflects the splendor and majesty of the occasion. Because this was royalty. And Isaiah saw the Lord's train, not only flowing behind him, but filling the temple. Because his majesty and splendor is beyond any human comparison. The description of the Lord is short, but instead we're told about his attendants. See verse 2. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. Now these attendants aren't like the the chubby babies you get of old art. The word seraph means something like burning ones. One writer describes them as living flames of pure nuclear powered praise. And they had six wings, two to cover their faces, because even these sinless, perfect creatures could not look on the face of God. With another two wings, they covered their feet, forever in a stance of bowing, of worship. And with the final two, they flew, hovering in constant flight, ready to do God's will. We don't know how many seraphs there were. I suspect a lot. (laughs) Enough, certainly, to fill heaven with the sound of their delighted worship. Verse 3. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. When a human is holy, it means they're more like God. And to say, to say that God is holy is really to say that God is God. The word holy means set apart. And there is no one more set apart than God. Different, other than the rest of us, than his creatures. In Hebrew, you can emphasize something by putting the word twice. So, you know, you get king of kings or lord of lords. But only once in the Old Testament do you get a description three times like this. Here, holy, holy, holy. Because the grammar doesn't even exist. These seraphs have to push at the boundaries of language to even describe the uniqueness of the Lord Almighty. Holiness multiplying up in exponentially increasing wonder for this God who is so beautifully set apart from all that he has made. One writer put it like this, God is as high above an archangel as above a caterpillar. And that's right, because... God is so set apart, so holy from all that he has created that creatures, angels and caterpillars are in one category over here. But then God is over here in his own category of existence. And the gulf between the two is infinitely great. And if God's holiness is his unique godness, then his glory is the manifestation, the appearance of his holiness in creation. The seraphs called out, the whole earth is full of his glory. For God in Trinity is so eternally delighted and enjoyed his own holiness that it kind of spills out, overflows into a creation full of his glory. And the seraphs join in that delighting in songs that never grow old, that are a never-ending applause that doesn't go on too long because he could never plumb the depths of God's worthiness for praise. And as they do, wow, what sound do they make? Verse 4, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook 
and the temple was filled with smoke. Every morning lying in bed, I listened to a few trucks drive by. There must be some sort of bump or pothole or something, because every time they go past, the whole house shakes. But only a little bit. I wonder if you take it up a notch, if anyone's ever been in a house under, underneath a, uh, a fighter jet going supersonic. You know, that sonic boom that shakes the windows, perhaps even shatters them somewhere. Well, that's not even enough, because here, at the voice of the seraphs, the temple foundations shake. As these flaming, supersonic creatures flying around, ready to do God's will. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have a big enough view of God. Yet that is the first domino for Isaiah. He saw the Lord's holiness. The next is quick to follow. Second, he realized he's unclean. Isaiah was overwhelmed. Verse 5, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. If you take this verse out of context, you might think I was being a bit over the top. But given what he's just seen, don't these words seem entirely reasonable? Uncleanness is just another way of talking about sin, the, the wrong he's done. And so when he sees the sparkling, clean holiness and perfection of God, the shame of his own uncleanness is too much to bear. I am ruined. This is the right response to a holy God. In Proverbs we're told that the beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. A right fear that understands that before a holy God we are Desperately dirty. For Isaiah, it was particularly the sin of his lips. Jesus said that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And while Isaiah's mouth should have been filled with seraph-like praise, it instead revealed his self-centeredness. And in this moment, he realizes that he's no better than his compatriots. There's no holier-than-thou attitude from him. He relates to them. He identifies with them. A man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And so, standing before the judge, he cries, Woe to me! But then, wonderfully, Domino 3, his guilt was taken away. He didn't call for forgiveness. He assumed he was doomed. But then, verse 6, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. I take it that a burning creature doesn't need to use tongs to get a burning coal, but these were holy coals. And with it, verse 7, he touched my Isaiah's mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Atoned in the Old Testament is a word that, that shouts sacrifice. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, when a guilt offering was made, it was a sacrifice that atoned or covered that person's sin. Of course, an animal could never really cover a person's sin. It was pointing forward, pointing forward to that great once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His altar wasn't a stone slab or fire pit. His was a wooden cross. And on it, he sacrificed, he was sacrificed to atone for our sin. And so here what we have with this symbolic coal is God applying the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to Isaiah to take away his sin. And then finally, stage four, he's ready to be sent. See verse eight. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I love that us, by the way. Little hint of the Trinity. And I said, here am I. Send me. Four dominoes. 
beginning with an encounter with the holy living reigning God that transforms Isaiah into God's forgiven servant, ready to be sent out as his witness. And so as we read Isaiah, we're faced with this question, how could this such stubborn, unwilling people who've turned their backs on their father and become ever more hardened to him, how could they ever lead to the hope and glorious visions we're about to see? And the answer is here in prototype form. It's through seeing God and his holiness that in turns, turn opens their eyes to their own sin. And through seeing God gently approaching them to take away their guilt and then finding themselves ready, transformed, willing to be his witnesses in the world. If we ever get to chapter 43, we'll see that part of the problem was whether God's people could do that job of being witnesses. And the answer is yes. But they need to start here. Now, it was pointed out to me rightly this week that last week I missed one of the most direct applications of our passage in chapter 1. I drew out the individual sin and God's grace to us as individuals But actually, Isaiah isn't just talking to individuals. He's talking to a nation. He's talking about corporate sin. And so, too, we must see in Isaiah what God is saying to us corporately. Now, the nation of Israel isn't pointing forward to modern-day nations. It's rather a picture of God's church, God's gathered people. And so just as Israel were failing in their task as witnesses, because God had become unreal to them. So too churches and whole denominations can do the same. And as God judged them by hardening them to his word, so too God can bring whole denominations to their knees. The picture of ruined cities at the end of this chapter is one that we shouldn't take lightly. And I think in this country, as we look to the wider church, especially the Church of England, with shrinking numbers, increasingly irrelevant to the surrounding culture, in many ways unfit for witness, it's worth asking, could this be happening? And I guess a probing question might be, is the God we have described here in Isaiah chapter 6, the God that we and our wider church are worshipping? Or put another way, do we have a big enough view of God? It's easy, I think, to shrink God to make him a bit more palatable. Theologians talk of God's transcendence, his total otherness, and his imminence, his closeness to us. And the Bible tells us God is both. I think we quite like talking about his closeness, don't we? God is love, and that is right. But it's easy to then accidentally end up with a small God, a God of our own making. Pieced together with our favorite passages, perhaps a God who just wants us to be happy. But the real God, he's here. The Lord Almighty blazing in holiness that even these supersonic flaming creatures of fire can't look upon him. Who when we see him for years terrifies us. Because he reveals our uncleanness, who rightly judges and will punish because he is just. But whose holiness includes his love, a holy love that sent his son to be a sacrifice for us. But the problem with a God like that, the true God, is that his holiness doesn't allow us to turn a blind eye to sin. There are some who think that staying quiet over the latest cultural issues, or even accepting what the Bible calls sin, will further the cause of mission and witness in this land. But that's not what our land needs. Our neighbours need an encounter with the true, holy, living God 
that transforms their lives. And they need a church so captivated by his holiness that she's ready to witness even when no one else will listen. So we need Isaiah 6 as a church. But can I suggest we also need Isaiah 6 as individuals. It's striking, I think, how there are two paths in this chapter. There's the path of hardening in the second half that I read at the beginning. One of the most important things anyone has ever said to me in my life was when I was a teenager and an older Christian said to me, it's very dangerous to hear the word of God and ignore it. Because you'll just become harder and harder. It rightly scared me because I knew at the time that I was ignoring God in many ways. And I was scared of where it would lead, that I'd get to the point of no return. It's a dangerous thing if you're sitting here today unmoved by God's word. If you've become somewhat sermon-proof. For as you've heard God's words preached, you can't be neutral. You either move closer to God, soften to God, or you move further away, harden to him. As you practice ignoring his call on your life, if that's you, you will never be more ready and open to respond to God's word as you are today. But then there's the other path, Isaiah's path. His four dominoes, the pattern that we can take too. And I wonder if this could be a useful pattern for each of us. Each day as we ready ourselves to be God's servants, his witnesses in his world. Looking to his holiness. And we primarily do that in his words. This might sound a little bit weird. But sometimes when I'm feeling a bit lacklustre in my faith, a bit cold toward God, you know, struggling to pray, or perhaps I'm stressed, distracted by all the things going on. Sometimes I do something that a tutor at theological college told me he does. I simply spend a few minutes looking at the sky. Okay, go with me on this. I look up because there's something about the grandeur of the sky that whatever particular form it is on that day, it lifts my eyes out of the distractions of this life and reminds me of the, the grandeur and glory of the God who made it, who sits behind it on his throne. Do you know that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? It's not exactly the same idea, but it has some wonderful lines. Our family played it a lot during lockdown. It starts, O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. The cure? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I don't know about you, but I need this every day. How quickly I forget God. Forget that he reigns. Forget his holiness. How quickly the things of earth get very big while God gets very small. Perhaps there'll be a moment this week when you need to remember this. And so I offer you this pattern. Turn your eyes upon the king. Turn your eyes upon the throne. And perhaps that will be the first domino that leads you to him. Why don't I pray? Our Father, we thank you for your great, glorious holiness. We pray that you might captivate our eyes, our hearts, our minds with you that we would be ready to do anything. Enlarge our vision of you, we pray. And Lord, I pray you might help us remember and reflect 
on the vision that we have here in Isaiah 6, that our eyes might be lifted to heaven. Amen. We're going to do something very unusual, just for a moment. Um, a bit like, you probably don't know, Marvel's Avengers film. Often have a uh, post credit scene. Well, I thought I'd just have a little post credit scene because I felt it would be terrible if I sat down having not read the last verse of this chapter. So could I just read that verse again? You might remember Isaiah chapter 1 ended with withered oak trees, dry like kindling. Well, here Isaiah returns to the trees. It's a picture of judgment, but then, verse 13, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will be again laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. A seed. Regrowth, perhaps. Well, you'll have to come back next week. Amen.